Sam Cedar, Emma Vigeland on the Majority Report. I want to welcome to the program Ilan Poppy, Professor of History at the University of Exeter, Director of the European Center for Palestine Studies, author of his most recent is The Ten Myths About Israel, uh, and this is also uh, coming off uh, his 2006 uh, Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. Uh, Professor, welcome to the program. Thank you, Sam and uh, Emma. Glad to be with you. Thank you. Um, you're in Haifa right now. Give us just a, a sense of like, before we get into, um, uh, the, the, the broader and, 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 and deeper questions here, but, um, what, what, give us a sense of what the mood is, uh, I, 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 as far as you can tell, I don't know how long you've been, um, in, in Haifa. Yes. Uh, probably long enough to, to answer your question at least. Um, the mood is 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 complex. Uh, it is first of all dictated by by the media, the mainstream media here, and, and the main theme there is revenge, revenge and uh, readiness for an attack, uh, a brutal attack, with very little, if at all, any compassion for what might happen in Gaza as a result. So the, I would say the. The ultimate motivation seems to be at this moment uh, revenge. But when you leave the media and you kind of go into the civil society and its outlets, you can see, first of all, a shock, a trauma. I mean, they haven't yet, Israel as is a Jewish society has not recovered from the trauma of the uh, morning of the 7th of October, a sense of uh, an army that cannot defend its. Um, its citizens, a government that cannot take care of its citizens after the attack, and apprehension of what might come as a result of an Israeli attack uh, on Gaza. So I, I would say that this is this is the kind of two basic uh, emotions that seem to drive the discourse, the conversation in Israel. And on top of all of it uh, is the whole question of those who were uh, taken to Gaza, more than 222 uh, people, including uh, children and, and old uh, people. Uh, and there begins to be, you can see the beginning of a debate of whether this is a, a crucial factor that should uh, dictate the next steps, or should the army and the politician, regardless of this, continue with their revengeful, uh, re retaliatory, uh, uh, operation uh, of grand uh, uh, land invasion and reoccupation of the Gaza Strip. And how does that relate to Netanyahu in public sentiment and his government? Yeah, Th that's a very good question. Um, uh, he definitely has lost uh, his main aura. His main aura was Mr. Security. It's very difficult for him to appear now as Mr. Security. That's for sure. He's trying to regain it with... Uh, the way he dons his nude uh, clothing as a, a general in the in the armed field, he doesn't take he inter, he, he gives interviews to a foreign uh, 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 outlets, but he doesn't give interviews to the Israeli uh, media. He only gives uh, statements, uh, a lot of war rhetoric, a lot of de de demonization of the of the Palestinians. But he, it's the, the sense is that he's also losing support in his base, among his base. Uh, first of all, because some of them were also victims of the attack of Saturday. Uh, and secondly, uh, the disaster or the fiasco is so huge that he cannot kind of overcome it with uh, usually what he usually succeeds in doing with words uh, and uh, accusing other people or other organization for the failure. I, I, I mean, I, my sense is that, or I, I would guess that the, um, the state of shock, the trauma, um, has inhibited the Israeli population to think beyond, you know, that question of, of, uh, of revenge and maybe beyond that question of, of, uh, Netanyahu's failure. But is there any, and, and, and it's obviously, you know, as we're uh, uh, at least, you know, at arm's length and, and a step removed from this, it's easier for us to contemplate these questions of how much of 
uh, what uh, of of the ideas of that there was authoritarianism coming home in the form of the, the the judicial reform, and then the question of the larger context of in which this you know uh, this this latest round of intense violence um, uh, sits. How much of that is being uh, you know contemplated? I would assume not that much, although that's where I think we want to go now. First of all, yes, definitely. We would have hoped that out of that tragedy, something more constructive would come out. But I would say that you, you noted two different things. One is whether people would relate the, the surprise, the fiasco, call it what you want, and of course the huge human tragedy, to uh, the way the Netanyahu government operated before the 7th of October, to its ideology, to its uh, intent to ruin what many Israelis saw as ruining the, the state system and infrastructure. And definitely that conversation is, you can already hear it. It's beginning, it's beginning. What you are talking about is, and what you and I, I suppose, and, and hope, I'm sure Emma as well, are hoping for, is that uh, some Israelis would say, wait a minute, we should have learned the lesson of the limitation of power, uh, we should have learned the lesson of what happens if you keep people under a brutal and inhuman siege for 15 years. And we should learn a lesson that uh, a war machine, uh, as mighty as it might be, does not help us to solve the main issue that makes life of everyone who lives between the river and the sea quite miserable. Uh, that kind of conversation has not yet developed. I'm an optimistic person. But I think it will take time. I, I do believe that it will eventually raise questions uh, about the invincibility of the Israeli army, the utility of using all the time force and oppression as means of, you know, uh, dealing or managing the life with the Palestinians in this piece of land. Uh, but I don't think it's going to happen very soon, unfortunately. Uh, but one one would one has to hope right. that uh, such a huge human tragedy on on both sides uh, would waken up at least large sections of the society to understand that there must be an alternative. Uh, as we started the conversation, the mood in Israel definitely now is not open for such a soul searching or such a reckoning. I, I imagine the that one of the the sort of to the extent that if and when we get to that place, part of it goes through the idea uh, that the, um, I mean, just uh, strictly on a, um, uh, a, a utilitarian perspective, if you will, um, there's only so many military personnel. And if you're going to send them from the border uh, from Gaza uh, to the West Bank to protect settlers, as they're, you know, uh, building a, a, a sukkah or the, as they're, you know, uh, trying to uh, take Palestinian homes, you start to realize like the math at one point is not going to work. Like that is a microcosm of a, 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 a problem that it's almost a peer into the future on some level. I think it's even more profound than that. Uh, if you think about the last big operation of Israel in Janine and the Janine refugee camp, if you need 1,000 soldiers and 100 armored vehicles in order to capture five Palestinian guerrillas uh, with very primitive weapon, it means that your army uh, is not able, actually, to defend uh, a proper guerrilla warfare or, or is not capable of dealing with it properly. Uh, in, I think some Israelis back in their mind have a nightmare scenario that they are very happy did not unfold. And that would, would have been a, a, a coordinated surprise attack by Hezbollah and Hamas at the same moment. Because the same thin layer of defense that uh, allowed the, the Hamas a relative easy entry into the areas around Gaza, the same thin layer also was there in, in, in the north. Of course, now it's, it's been emboldened by, by Israeli uh, uh, army, but it was not there on the 7th of October. Uh, and uh, one wonders how Israel would have come out from a twin attack, a coordinated attack, and so on. 
so so yes, I, I, I think this is not just a matter of, uh, you know, that there's not enough soldiers or, or you have to get your priorities right. Um, it is the whole idea that you are not involved in one event. You are involved in a structure. You are involved in a structure of colonization, oppression, ethnic cleansing that began in 1948. And, and you are not going to get out of it but one big bang. Neither would the Palestinians be able to liberate themselves with one successful military operation. But it's only going to escalate and one cycle after a cycle of bloodshed would unfortunately unfold. And there are alternatives. But, but you know, the, the people who talk about the alternatives are not the ones people want to hear right now. I, I want to get to those alternatives, but I, I do want to spend a little bit of, t uh, uh, of time in the broader context. And, and, you know, when starting in 1948, maybe even before then, in terms of like the, the, the genesis of, of Zionism. Um, but w what's the value of that project? In other words, like, you know, the, I mean, f uh, I, I, I this has been a question that, that you know, in terms of, of, of Israel and as, as a Jew who was raised, uh, you know, with a Hebrew education in the 70s. Uh, I've said this on the program many times. I had uh, Hebrew teachers who uh, had tattoos from the Holocaust. And it was we learned about the Holocaust, which was the premise. And that was only 30 years. You know, when I was my son's age, uh, it was had only been uh, 30 years earlier. Uh, now we're, you know, uh, 40 years, 50 years out, uh, close to, to when I learned those things and just to give a sense of time to an audience that might be, you know, younger than I, uh, but the second thing was, was, was Israel. And there was for as long as I can remember, there was always a sort of like an argument, uh, as to who's, who had the moral right, righteousness in uh, the, uh, the debate and, uh, you know, over time, I found that sort of like a, a fool's errand. But what is important to know about the, uh, the, the, the founding of Israel? Because there's, a, there's also, I think, been a, an anag analogous sort of like to a dunning school uh, in, in this uh, country in terms of uh, Reconstruction and the Civil War. And there was a version of that with the founding of Israel. So, I mean... First, but but first, tell us about like the importance of knowing this history. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that there are two sort of elements that are important uh, to remember in a very short uh, and abrupt uh, kind of uh, uh, a crash history uh, course. One is that Zionism emerged uh, in the late 19th century as an ideological movement that was seeking a safe haven for Jews who were persecuted by anti-Semitism, and also had a new idea that excited all Europe at the time, that actually Judaism is not a religion, but actually nationalism. So if you combine the two ideas that you're looking for a safe heaven, which is not in Europe, because Europe is not safe, and you're looking for a, a new idea of a new definition of Judaism, then Palestine comes naturally to, to their mind because of the uh, connection of the, to the Bible in the Jewish faith. That, that's one element, the element of, of looking for uh, a panacea, a response to, to anti-Semitism and for a Europe that doesn't want you to be part of it. So, and by the way, this is not unique to Zionism. Settler colonial movements that were seeking safe haven from European persecution founded the United States. Uh, as well as, as Canada and, and, and Australia and New Zealand. The second element is, and exactly coming back to this comparison with these other settler colonial movement, is that Zionism, like other movements of refugees from Europe, uh, opted for a country that already was inhibited by another people. And they chose an historical moment by which these people were already building a modern identity, a national identity, and had their aspiration like the rest of, of the world at the time, for independent self-determination. Uh, the moment Zionism insisted that the only place for a safe Jewish haven is Palestine, it became a colonialist, I would say settler colonialist movement, that clashed with the indigenous native people of Palestine. And like most 
settler colonial movements as happened in the United States, it shows the elimination of the native as the best way of fulfilling its dream for a safe modern Jewish state. It was unable to fulfill this idea in full and we are all the time within that parameter. A Jewish national movement trying to get as much of Palestine as possible with as few Palestinians in it in an anti-colonialist Palestinian movement doing all it can, sometimes with better means, sometimes with quite uh, terrible means, to try and defend itself from that uh, project. Uh, you know, there was, a, 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 if I may, just one more sentence, Sam, there was a great scholar of uh, settler colonialism, the late Patrick Wolf, and he said that settler colonialism is not an event, it's a structure. It doesn't happen in one day. As long as there is a, an, a DNA for the settler colonialist the, uh, that totally erases the native, the indigenous, from its future, then there's always a danger of annihilation for the natives and over a danger, always a danger that the native or indigenous would fight back with everything at their disposal. Was, was that element of the DNA, the elimination of the, the indigenous, was that always uh, uh, exclusive uh, in within Zionism? I mean, when I look back at like uh, you know the the the, the charter in the uh, uh, around World War, I guess World War One uh, mm -hmm. of the Zionist Charter, there was a sense of like we're looking for a uh, a land where where rights are respected regardless of of race or religion, there are equal rights in that thing. I mean, is there, is, uh, do you need that, that element within the DNA of, of, of this movement, uh, to eliminate the indigenous or is it, can you, to, to qualify as a, as settler, uh, colonialism or can the idea of like, we're going to, uh, you know, this is going to be a home, but it's going to be a, uh, a multicultural, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, you know, sort of environment. That it's not necessarily going to be an exclusively a Jewish state. Uh, you know, first of all, let me explain. Elimination of the native is not necessarily genocide, as happened in North America. Elimination of the native as in the case of Palestine, can be also translated to ethnic cleansing, that is, transfer of people, or enclaving them, or sieging them in Gaza. Um, ironically, Sam, what is really ironic is that the, from the very beginning, the leaders and the thinkers of the Zionist movement were envisioning a democratic state that was highly important for them. And for a democratic state, you need the demography to equate uh, the, uh, the democracy. In other words, you need a constant majority of Jews, at least a constant majority, if not exclusive Jewish presence there. This is so ironic in, in a way. If, I, I'll give you a, a concrete example for this. Had Israel not expelled by force three quarter of a million Palestinians during the Nakba, the catastrophe, during 1948. In the first Israeli election in 1949, the Jews will, would not have been the majority. Now, it's quite likely the Palestinians would not have voted for a Jewish state. By the way, they would have voted gladly for a democratic, uh, pluralistic state. But this was not an option as far as the Zionist movement is concerned. This is exactly the issue. The issue is that it's terrible in the 21st century to believe that there could be an ideology that is allowed to say, whoever is my citizens, I don't care, uh, but there is a, su a superiority that I ensure to my own race, my own faith, my own religion. Uh, this is unacceptable. This is really unacceptable. And yet, I don't have to tell you this, Israel is commodified as the only democracy uh, in the Middle East. But it is an ethnic racist state that believes that uh, your Jewishness is the ticket for being member of the Republic, if you want. Uh, and that, that is just a, a modern face 
of the old settler colonial idea, let's get rid of the indigenous, and then we can build a, a beautiful demo Jewish democracy uh, in, on, on, in Palestine. Well, as you say, it's an ethno state. And, and I, I, I'm wondering if you could return to the original intent of Israel um, by, you know, in the Balfour Declaration and when, at the nation's founding. Um, my understanding is that there were some very anti-Semitic undertones in the way that the British conceived of Israel. Um, is that accurate? And is that important in understanding the the, the context of how uh, Israel is, is constituted today. Yes, uh, Emma, I think it's very important. It's even beyond the Balfour Declaration. Uh, people tend to forget that Zionism began as a project of evangelical Christianity, long before Jewish intellectuals suggested the idea of creating a Jewish state in Palestine. This was quite a vision supported by many uh, evangelical Christians on both sides of the Atlantic. And the motivation was anti-Semitic in a way, because in the vision of evangelical Christianity, uh, a, a millennialist view could only be implemented uh, if the Jews would return to Palestine. It had to be, or the, or, or the Holy Land, as they would have called it. Namely, you could not have the end of time, the resurrection of the death, uh, the return of the Messiah, without the return of the Jews to Palestine. Now, and. and we should add, and their conversion into Christianity. That was part of the deal. But it created a good pretext to encourage the idea that the Jews should not live either in the United States or in Europe. They should go to, to, to Palestine. So it was a kind, I, I used to call it the double bill for anti-Semites because they get rid of the Jews and so to speak, they get the, back the only Jew they want, which is uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, this is this is very important. Now, this kind of group was very important among the British policymakers, and uh, Lord Balfour, who is behind the Balfour Declaration, was a very known anti-Semite. His greatest worry was that anti-Semitism in Russia would push uh, hundreds of thousands of Jews into Britain. So he legislated in 1906 the Aliens uh, Act in the British Parliament that was specifically meant to disallow British refugees from Russia to come to Britain. Not surprisingly, when he began his connection with the, Balf with the Zionist movement, he saw even a better solution than trying by force to prevent Jews from Eastern Europe to come to Britain. It was better to reorientate them to Palestine. On top of it, he was told by British imperialist strategies that a Jewish Palestine would justify the integration or the incorporation of Britain, uh, of Palestine within the British Empire. Because we have to remember, we're talking at a time when Palestine is still part of the Ottoman Empire, but the, those who fight against Turkey, Austria, Hungary, and Germany begin to envision how they will divide the spoils. Who would have what? And a, a strong connection with the Zionist movement enabled Britain to say to France, and other allies, Palestine should be part of the British sphere of influence because of its special connection with the Zionist movement. And we should say that that, that impetus is perhaps one of the biggest drivers of, within American politics now, the, the Christian Zionist movement has a similar thing. Now, we should, I, I think it's also fair to say that like there was in, in, in Judaism since the you know the the destruction of the second temple a at the very least um a metaphorical sort of desire to return to jerusalem right i mean we we say this uh, in that uh, the the jewish uh, holidays of rosh hashanah and passover you know next year in jerusalem but it was always less uh, a a political movement and more of a i guess a um uh, a, a, a metaphorical idea at that time. Well, let's let's talk about also the, one of the sort of um, the 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 sort of the, the myths that grew up around uh, what existed in Palestine in 1948. Um, for me, one of the most enlightening things is a, 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 a this this movie called uh, the Great Book Robbery uh, mm -hmm. by by Benny oh. Bruner. I met Benny uh, years ago in a different life, and uh, that film was very uh, sort of instrumental in 
sort of a very sort of like um comfortable way to sort of come to the idea that like wait a second this was not a, a question of just people just wandering through there was in fact uh if not a a uh, sort of some type of federal government there was a civilization that existed in 1948 in palestine yeah definitely uh, uh the myth that uh the zionist movement found a desert and bloomed it that unfortunately was repeated by the president of the eu uh is is quite uh, uh unacceptable today with so much research uh, 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 available for us to show that this is nonsense. Uh, Palestine had a vibrant society, a very educated urban elite. A lot of people were living in the rural areas, but that was the situation in the world at large in the mid 19th century. Uh, it was cosmopolitical in many ways, especially on the coast. Uh, Jews, Muslims, and Christians shared neighborhoods and villages. Uh, there was a genuine coexistence, you know, not, not the uh, kind of more uh, 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 artificial coexistence. It was a genuine coexistence. It was organically connected to the rest of the Arab world uh, and therefore benefited from the cultural renaissance, which we call in Arabic the Nahada, the cultural renaissance in the Arab world in the 19th century. Uh, and it's interesting that you're mentioning books because there was a very famous saying in the, in the Middle East uh, uh, at the time of uh, the beginning of the 20th century that the good books are uh, written, written in Egypt, are printed in Lebanon, and are being read in Jaffa uh, or in Palestine. Uh, it, that, that was the sense that the Palestinians were the, the, the educated people people consuming of of culture by the way not only arab culture but also western culture and uh and the biggest tragedy of palestine is that especially after the second world war uh the palestinian society took off in terms of uh, modernization education wealth uh and that was totally cut off uh, three years later uh, by the by the catastrophe but what happened in 48 was a destruction of an organic society uh, that was on the way to a different phase of modernization, a different phase of nationalization, and with a huge human capital that we know exists because after 48, it contributed significantly to the development of educational system in Iraq, in Egypt, and to the financial systems of Lebanon, and to the government administration in Jordan. There was a human capital in Palestine uh, that would have, to my mind, turned Palestine in one of the most important and inspiring uh, countries in the Arab world, but this did not happen in '48. And uh, let's address the the myth that these people um, that you're talking about, particularly the, the, the sort of like I guess the brain drain of that of that specific area, or I guess the dispersal of of that uh, human capital. Um, left voluntarily. Um, this is also, I think, sort of part and parcel, you know, of, uh, of of the myth. And again, like I, you know, I go back and forth as to, you know, how much of this is really important to to uh, like sort of looking at the situation today. But for so many, it seems to me that when you talk about today, they'll immediately go to. 1973 or 1967 or 1948 and say well, people left or or, or 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 the holocaust and so these things have a resonance um so w the idea that that palestinians just decided well we're just gonna leave uh because um uh, uh leadership has said you should go um tell uh, tell us what the the reality of that is Yes, also the reality and why is it important today to know that reality. Um, we now have a, a, a quite a, 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 a enough number of documents that were declassified by Israel, which by the way, Israel reclassified la lately, but never, never, never mind were declassified in time in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and enough documents declassified by the United Nations, the United States and Britain to give us a very accurate uh, uh, picture of 
why the Palestinians became refugees. And it's very, very clear that the uh, Zionist leadership and after that the Israeli leadership systematically planned the mass expulsion of the Palestinians, what I called ethnic cleansing. Because if you get rid of people because of their ethnicity in large number, the only way of describing it is ethnic uh, cleansing. And, and this was done uh, even before the 15th of May, before the end of the mandate and before one Arab soldier entered Palestine, because one of the important uh, uh, element in the Israeli mythology of this is that the Arab world sent its troops into Palestine and, and told the Palestinians to leave. And that's why the Palestinians became refugees. Or in a more liberal Zionist version, what can you do if, if, if the Arab world comes to destroy the state of Israel, there is a collateral damage, namely Palestinian refugees. But most, not most, but half at least of the Palestinians uh, who became refugees, became refugees before the 15th of May, 1948. Most of the cities and towns of Palestine were ethnically cleansed in April, 1948, uh, as part of a plan D, a, a master plan for the ethnic cleansing of Palestine uh, that was ideological in the sense that if Israel is going to be a viable state as a Jewish democracy, as a Jewish democracy, it cannot tolerate a large number of Palestinians in that future state. Now, why is it important for today? What is important for today is not only the ethnic cleansing of 1948, far more important is the international reaction to that ethnic cleansing. Uh, you know, there were report, American reporters on the ground, there were United Nations emissaries on the ground, the International Red Cross had its own people on the ground. People knew about the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. It was not a secret. You cannot kick out almost one million people and the world not knowing. But there was a conscious decision that uh, Israel should be allowed to do it as a compensation for the Holocaust, for anti-Semitism, or as one American diplomat put it, in order to, we, we are allowing a small injustice in order to correct a much bigger uh, injustice. Nobody thought it was just in America, in America, among American policymakers who knew exactly what was going on on the ground. The problem was that the message to, for Israel was that it can use ethnic cleansing, while maybe other democracies cannot use it, as means for strategizing. And that's why Israel continued the ethnic cleansing. Until 1967, it expelled 36 villages from inside Israel. During the 67 war, it expelled 300,000 Palestinians. Since 1967 until today, Israel expelled more than half a million Palestinians from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And as just before the 7th of October, ethnic cleansing operations were taking place in East Jerusalem, the south of Hebron, and the Jordan Valley. So, so expelling Palestinian either in, either in small numbers or in large numbers, as is being done now in the Gaza Strip, is part of what Israel thinks is a legitimate arsenal of maintaining the viability of a Jewish state. And it the sense in Israel is that the international community, if not the civil society, governments accept it as an unnecessary evil for uh, keeping Israel alive. And, and that is, I think, so key, the context there and the systematic ethnic cleansing. And you see the map of Palestinian territory shrinking as those decades pass to understanding the hollowness of the calls by someone like Biden, who I saw put out a, uh, a tweet saying that um, we have to move towards a two state solution. Can you talk a bit about how that's essentially such an unserious request at this point because of how much territory has been taken? In my opinion, the only real solution to ending the cycle of violence is a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy where Palestinians are given full rights. Um, I, I'm curious about your assessment of that path forward. Yeah. First of all, Emma, I, I agree with you. I think that's the only that's the only way forward. Uh, not only because of the impracticality, and I will talk about it in a minute, of the two-state solution now with the new established facts on the ground, but also as a principle, as a principle, uh, as the best way forward for a, a country that has millions of a third generation of settlers, if you want, 
and millions of the indigenous people, many of them still millions, refugees outside the country. The only way of reconciling uh, uh, these two communities is through uh, a multiracial, multi-ethnic uh, uh, democratic state uh, that would be a win-win. It would be a win-win formula for everyone concerned. Now, more concretely, I, I agree. I mean, uh, because the settler colonial movement has these two dimensions, geography and demography, or space and population, Israel always had this dilemma. It wanted more space, but with more space came more Palestinians. So what they decided in 1967, and I wrote about it in my book, uh, The Biggest Prison on Earth, what they decided in 1967 is not to expel massively the Palestinians as they did in 1948, but to create this matrix of power that enclaves the Palestinians in such a way and does not allow them to expand that actually you don't have demographically to calculate them in your democracy. So millions of Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank could not vote, could not be elected, could not take part in their future. Israel called that solution a two-state solution. Uh, uh, even the most feeble Palestinian uh, a leader like uh, uh, Abu Mazen could not accept it. A and now, for all practical uh, intents and purposes, 60% uh, of the West Bank is already annexed to Israel in one way or another. To create in this uh, bisected uh, remaining 40% of the West Bank, a Palestinian state that would signify an international recognition the rights of the Palestinians for self-determination is a joke is a joke at best. And anyway, I don't think the Israelis would allow either a one state or a two state. So, so I don't think that's, that's a big question. And America would not force Israel to have the two states. It would allow Israel to continue with the status quo. Uh, it, it, they may talk the talk, but they won't walk the walk, so to speak. A and therefore, we have one state now, but it's an apartheid state. It's an oppressive state. And it will have to be dynamics from within that would change the regime rather than create another state. Uh, but this needs, of course, an international support and solidarity as happened in apartheid South Africa. I, I want to get to how we can get there, but I, I just want to go back, um, if we could, to the... Um, you, you mentioned uh, the 1980s and 90s when there was a declassification, when there sort of was this sense um, that maybe the Israeli government there was, uh, I, I don't know, you, you would have a better sense of, of what um, the, the reasons why this declassification happened then, as opposed to earlier or, you know, and this reclassification happening now. But can you talk about that and maybe talk a little bit about how you came to, um, uh, you know, your work in, in studying this? Because I think this is... Uh, you know, I mentioned the Dunning School, and I think this is an important sort of like uh, a part of the story to tell because these myths have allowed both um, Israelis, increasingly Israelis, uh, I, I think, from from my my outside perspective, and um, uh, American Jewry at least, to sort of justify. We have in this country a you know a concept of of uh, Jews tending to be more progressive than the uh, in liberal and leftist than the average, let's say, American uh, generally, except on this issue. Um, and part of it, I, you know, from my own experience is sort of um, I know how my generation was raised um, and part of it being not having access to these actual like the, the reality you know, in this country, we have not fully compensated or come to terms with it, but there is an awareness that we were a settler colonial project mm -hmm. and we uh, committed genocide uh, on uh, the indigenous people here. Um, on some level, we have the, the sort of luxury of saying this happened hundreds of years ago and so it's a settled matter and this and that. Uh, it, is, it is clearly not a settled matter uh, in Israel. What, what, tell us about that era and what what happened and and how you came to sort of like uh, to 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 study this. Yeah, 
I think when the Israelis uh, declassified uh, the, the documents of 1948 in the 80s and the 90s, they assumed, and they were not totally wrong, that most Israeli historians, and even historians outside of Israel, who would see the documentation, would still uh, corroborate the Israeli narrative. And I'll, I'll give you one example why they thought that way. One of the things you see from the documents is that the Israeli forces, and before that the pre, uh, pre-state uh, forces, uh, looked at every Palestinian village and every Palestinian neighborhood in Palestine as an enemy base. Uh, this is kind of a dehumanization, where, where the people who live in a village, whether they are babies or, or old women, uh, are the enemy, they are, and, and, the, and the village is the base. And therefore, and it's a hostile base. And therefore, when you attack it and you destroy the village or kill some of the people or expel the others, it's a, an act of self-defense because that's the way they understood it. And that's the way they behaved uh, in uh, Lebanon in 1982 and in the first Intifada in 1987. So and the mindset was supposed to be the same of those who declassified the documents and those who used it as professional historians. I think they were genuinely surprised that there was a small bunch of Israeli historians, and I was one of them, that said, wait a minute, this is, this is immoral. This is unacceptable. This is against what you told us of what happened in 1948. Just to begin with the fact that nobody left voluntarily, it seems, in Palestine. The people were expelled. Some, some of us who were so-called the new historians said, at least tell the truth, we might accept your justification for that. I think I was a bit different from the rest of the new historians by saying that you didn't tell us the truth and I see no justification for what you did, which was unique because that position was not adopted by the other so-called revisionist historians of Israel. Why did I come to this position? Why did I got out of the tribal boundaries so to speak, either of my academic community, which cost me my position in Haifa University, or uh, began, became a pariah, if not a traitor, in the eyes of my own society, I, I really, Sam, have no good explanation. I wrote a book about it, called Out of the Frame, trying for myself to understand uh, the journey, also in order to know whether other people w- w- were able to do it, and some people were. I think the best one can say is a journey. It's a journey that has stations that allow you to deprogram yourself, if you want, to liberate yourself from a certain ideology and reconnect with your humanity, with your basic humanity, with your best basic moral values. Uh, For me, spending a long time outside of Israel was helpful. Choosing an Arab supervisor for my doctoral dissertation was very important, a very intimate and, and, and friendly relationship with Edward Said was important, meeting Palestinians outside of Israel on equal footing, not as a part of the oppressing co- a community. It all somehow fused into a, a moment of, I wouldn't say even epiphany, it's a moment of crossing the river and knowing you will never go back to the other side of, of, of the river. Uh, um, today, I cannot understand educated American Jews or educated Christian Jews or educated Israelis who don't even feel a compassion towards the Palestinian suffering. I, I don't even want to begin with justifications and so on. But I think that the worst thing I meet in Israel, uh, which really disturbs me, is the lack of compassion. You can, of course, you can see it now, and you would say, "Okay, now you should understand that they are not show no compassion to the by now 2,200 pe- uh, children that already were killed in Gaza because of the because of their revenge." But really, in 2023, members of a democratic society cannot show compassion to 2,000 babies that were killed, whatever the context of what had happened. I, I don't accept it. So I think there's something sick in the nation that that uh, I'm very glad I liberated myself from this. But I don't have a clear formula that I can sell uh, to others. I definitely cannot fel- uh, blame my family, and I cannot blame my school. And uh, I'm definitely a flow product of the Israeli uh, mass production, 
but uh, you know, it's 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 something that I hope uh, will grow in the future because if we don't have this impulse of basic humanity uh, uh, within the Israeli society, we will have to wait for its defeat from the outside, which I don't want to, because I think it would be horrible. And what we uh, what we've seen in Saturday is just a prelude. Uh, so I really hope that they will change from within and, and get a more universal perspective of what they have done and what they're doing. Was there an era in which you think there was a genuine opportunity to go in a different direction? Um, but was that era around the declassification? Um, did, did things markedly change in a different way? Um, I wonder, I mean, I, you know, uh, I mean, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, I had been on a confirmation trip in Israel. We were in Caesarea in 1982. We saw helicopters going across, uh, the coast that were, we ultimately, uh, understood were beginning to bomb Beirut. And that was, you know, for me personally, that became, uh, an issue for me and uh, I stopped talking to my rabbi on that trip and was a little bit, but I wonder. And, and so for me, that era is like when the beginning of like a trajectory or a shift in trajectory that, that, you know, has led us here, but maybe it, that existed from, I don't know, 1930, uh, that it, that it was the, the, the die was cast. Then do, do you have a sense of that? Was there, was there a, was there an opportunity to go in a different direction uh, at a, at any time during Israel's history? Yes, I do think so. I think there, there were more than more more than one junction in history. Uh, for example, in the 1920s, you had Brit Shalom, the, the 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 Jewish intellectuals like Martin Buber, who were definitely willing uh, to envision a binational state uh, as a solution. But I think we have to look at all these uh, junctures. Uh, like before Oslo, during the the Madrid conference, and maybe even during Oslo itself, or towards the end of uh, uh, the 20th century, as small flames of fire, if they are in the inside, if they don't get the fuel from the outside, they cannot change the reality on the ground. Namely, for meaningful voices of dissent in Israel that would offer an alternative to be effective they need to be fully enhanced and empowered from the outside. Uh, the society is so indoctrinated. I mean, the Israeli indoctrination is from cradle to the grave. Uh, you have no idea. I mean, I, I can tell you because <laughs> I've been indoctrinated in such a way. It's incredible how you are indoctrinated in Israel. And, 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 and therefore, anybody who's brave enough to, to challenge it uh, uh, feels very vulnerable. And uh, without the support from the outside, it's very, very difficult. And I think one of the positive things that happened recently is that the Palestinian liberation movement that in the 1970s could not even envisage uh, Jews as partners in the liberation because they saw all the Jews as settlers in, in Palestine. There is a realization, especially in the younger generation of Palestinians, that the reality of 2023 is different from the reality in 1948, namely the settlers are an organic part of the reality and will be an organic part of the future. And therefore, I think there's a different kind of conversation, uh, uh, Emma already pointed out to this, of not just liberating Palestine and making it an Arab Palestine without Jews, but a Palestine which will be uh, uh, a multi-ethnic, multi racial uh, 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 country country where, uh, of course, all the evils of the past should be rectified as much as possible, including the expulsion of the refugees, but one that should offer something for everyone, not just uh, the oppressed, but also those who were part of the oppressor. Um, but for this, again, this needs to be the discourse of the political leaderships in the world. This needs to be the discourse that replaces the, the false discourse of peace that we have now for these uh, inside voices to become uh, meaningful. But yes, they were always there uh, because nobody should vilify all the Jews who live in Israel as nobody should vilify any any society. Uh, but um, 
this is very important to see the connection between that and uh, and the outside world. And and you know, is look who Israel's allies are today. Forget about the seventh of October uh, of October for a moment. Until the sixth of October, uh, Donald Trump uh, uh, or Erdogan in Hungary, the neo right, the neo Nazis, the neo right wings in Europe. These were all the the allies of of, of Israel. Uh, because Israel found it very difficult to to resurrect alliances it had at the beginning with social democratic forces, with with democratic forces, not to mention movement on the left. Uh, the reality on the ground was too was too evident for people with a modicum of decency or belief in human rights and justice to say, "I'm a supporter of Israel today." Uh, Israelis, by the way, live under the illusion. That what happened in the 7th of October erased it all. It's amazing to read the Israeli analysis here. They really believe that they are absolved from everything they have done in the past and they have an absolution of what they're doing now. And the whole discourse about Israel is going to change. No more colonialism, no more settler colonialism, no more apartheid like Amnesty International suggested. They really believe that it almost was a painful, horrific event that enables Israel to fight more successfully the be- the moral battle. Of course, they're totally wrong. But is but it, it, uh, is that is that a sense of like um, there's a perception? I mean, from uh, from your view, is that is that a perception that Israeli has about um, their? It, it's it's cathartic in that way for them, or do they believe that that is what the world's perspective, how the world's perspective is going to change? Because I mean. If it's the latter, they're not watching enough international news. Um, but if it's the uh, former, that's that's a real step in the wrong direction in terms of like ever getting. And I don't know if this it may be a multi generational project to be able to get to uh, an Israeli population that uh, can sort of like see this without some other horrible tragedy happening before then. You know, when when uh, the British Parliament is donned with the colors of the Israeli uh, flag or the Eiffel Tower, or there are these gestures in America or these unconditional support we heard from President Biden, this is the way they are understood in Israel. Oh, now you walk up. Now you understand exactly who, uh, who we are facing. The whole discourse of Hamas is ISIS, or worse than the Nazis, not like the Nazis, but worse than the Nazis, is exactly that. You see, you, you were blinded, you liberals, you Democrats, uh, you were uh, blinded and, and didn't listen to us who the enemy really is. Uh, of course, they're totally wrong. I don't think this is the, the picture in the world, but this is how they would feel. Now, do remember what kind of a government the Israeli electorate uh, voted for in November 2022. They voted for a coalition that uh, its main pillar were, it's not even Zionist Jews, were Messianic Jews, Messianic Jews that grew up in the settlements, uh, who don't care about international opinion, that think that God is on their side, and a very uh, cruel, ruthless God is on their side. History is on the side. Their main problem is not just the world, but also weaklings like myself and you, maybe, uh, uh, among the Jewish people, self-hating Jew, call them what you want. Uh, and and it's interesting how they read this event on the 7th of October. They don't take any responsibility for this. They say it will be a wake-up call for the liberals in Israel as well to understand you cannot rely on anyone. I mean, at the same time, they're very happy that America sent two, two uh, uh, carriers into the, into the Mediterranean. It's it's, it's a moment of reckoning uh, that we should not be misled by the optical illusions of the immediate reactions. So I, 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 we have to wait and see whether these uh, misrepresentation of what the world thinks about what happened or misunderstanding of what the world has, uh, has reacted to, whether they will you know, infiltrate or penetrate this shield uh, of uh, messianic Zionism, this extreme Zionism that uh, Israeli voters seem to like, uh, judging by the results of the last elections. Are, are there 
in terms of the makeup of the Israeli population, is there, I mean, because personally, my sense is that almost definitionally, if you are a messianic anything, that you that's almost definitionally what happens in the profane world is not going to permeate that uh, your belief system and the, and you're and, fundamentalist yes and yeah. the and and uh, it it seems to me that when we look at like particularly the the settlers there's 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 two types there's that type of messianic uh, um you know uh fundamentalism and also sort of an authoritarian um, uh, ethno-nationalism that also shares at least the modality of fundamentalism, whether, whether they are, you know, as, as religious in practice uh, as not. How much of the Israeli society is left that after that, you know, in terms of a percentage where they are, there is even potential for that? Because my sense is, is that the sort of like, the um the type of uh of of immigration to israel that has taken pl place over the past several decades has changed the dynamic in terms of the israeli population but you'd have a, obviously a much better sense in that than i yes i think you saw what is left on the streets of tel aviv and israeli towns before the 7th of october i mean after all hundreds of thousands of israelis demonstrated against the, the other, both the, this coalition of Messianic Jews and those authoritarian Jews. So, so there was this kind of liberal Zionist uh, reaction that manifested itself in the mass uh, demonstration we have seen. I called it the, the struggle between the state of Judea, the Messianic state that was born in the settlements, and the state of Israel that still tries to have this kind of liberal, multicultural uh, 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 characteristic. The problem was uh, that uh, the elephant in the room, the occupation, the Palestinian issue, is not was not part of this discussion. Right. Namely, those who are opposing what I call the state of Judea uh, are not opposing the apartheid against the Palestinians. They just don't want Tel Aviv to look like a settlement uh, in the West Bank. But they don't care if Jaffa continues to be de-Arabized, ethnically cleansed, and Palestinians living a second-rate uh, citizens, and I think that that's the main problem. Um, uh, maybe that's possible that uh, the events of the seventh of October, at least to, for the liberal Jews, were still there, were still there in Israel. Not not in great numbers, but they're still and they're significant as an elite group, more than demographically in terms of number. As an elite group, they're still significant. Whether these events will somehow open their eyes about. Uh, the need, the kind of concessions, I wouldn't even call it concession, the kind of a reality check that they should have if they want uh, to have something that is akin to normal life for themselves, and if not for themselves, for the children and grandchildren in, in the future. So far, I don't see this. But again, I, I, I think we are in a society that is now both traumatized and, uh, and is being manipulated to think only about revenge and, and, and justified barbarism as the only way of getting out of the trauma of Saturday, the 7th of October. But hopefully this, this will not last for, 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 forever. Um, I'm sorry, I know that we've kept you long, but just one more That's question okay. here. Um, do you believe that there are moves now to annex North Gaza? Is that, do you think, the goal of the uh, Israeli government at this point? Of course, I'm not privy to their uh, <laughs> to their uh, drawers. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's. In fact, I'm quite confident it's one of the scenarios that they are thinking about. Um, uh, and uh, you remember, the government still has this messianic settler element in it, despite the fact that they created an emergency government and added some more sober, if you want, Zionist into the decision making process. These. These uh, 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 fanatic fundamentalists are still part of the government. They are definitely would like to see the return of Jewish settlers to some parts uh, of Gaza and, and definitely hope that this kind of development would allow their return to, uh, for them, this would cle uh, heal the trauma of the eviction. Um, I don't think that most of those who are involved now in 
preparing the uh, land invasion in this emergency um, a cabinet are thinking that far. In, in fact, the sense is that it reminds a little bit the American reaction, you know, in Iraq and Baghdad, in Iraq and Afghanistan, where there was a, a clear sense that there's no planning to, to, for the day after. I don't think there's a serious uh, discussion in Israel of the day after. Uh, and uh, the whole energy is invested in what they think would be the revenge that would satisfy the Israelis, and somehow they have this idea that they are able to eliminate the Hamas altogether, uh, both from Gaza and from the political scene, which is another uh, heuristic, uh, 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 unrealistic uh, project. Of Israel. Yeah, I, Emma said that was the last question. I promise this <laughs> is the last question because it was just okay. spurred by what you said, because... Um, in in my mind, in terms of Iraq, it wasn't just about a failure to plan for the day after. It was also a delusion as to what happens on day one. And mm -hmm. the the um, it it is hard for me to believe that um, Hamas did not um, assume that the Israeli reaction would be to uh, to 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 enter into Gaza. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an assumption that there is, you know, uh, the Israeli government should do some planning of like what happens once they get rid of Hamas. Um, but that to me seems like a, a, a very, very big assumption. Even if you could inhibit somehow the, uh, a, a, a response of a, you know, sort of a, a new Hamas coming out of the rubble, just in terms of the existing Hamas, um, the, it, you can go in there with a hundred thousand troops. It's still not clear to me that you're going to be able to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, clear it out, you know, and just eliminate every Hamas fighter, you know, in, in a matter of months or, you know, I don't know. I mean, like what, what is the, t the tolerance of the Israeli society for a failure, I guess, from uh, Netanyahu again. I mean, to see the because my sense is there is a uh, a clear sort of unified desire for revenge, but also a nearly clear unified response that Netanyahu failed once, and there it seems to me that like you know uh, the the opportunity for failure based upon expectations is is rather high, and that with a guy like Netanyahu and, you know, the, the other people that at least made up his, uh, uh, ruling coalition, that's a scary, uh, scenario because I, you know, I think this guy wants to stay in office as much as, you know, Donald Trump wants to get in office to stay out of jail. Absolutely. And I can, I can really corroborate what you say in something that is now top news in Israel in the last day or two. A group of uh, politicians who are very close to Netanyahu, you can call them members of the Netanyahu political household, uh, have uh, produced a, a clip that have went viral in Israeli networks, uh, which advocates the continuation of bombing from the outside without getting going in. This is cannot be done without Netanyahu's author, uh, authorization for this clip. He will do all he can, and that's why that's why we don't see yet a land invasion. He will do all he can to delay the invasion or to limit it. The last thing he wants uh, is a full-scale invasion with the possibility of such a large number of Israeli casualties. However, he cannot say it in, in his own voice. Uh, neither is uh, are those who he invited to the government, Gantz and uh, Ashke uh, not Ashkenazi, the other guy, uh, Eisenkut, the two ex-generals who uh, are respons they are themselves responsible for some war crimes in Gaza, uh, are, are willing to, to accept this idea. So, so the army is now wishing for a land invasion, wants a land invasion. Some of the so-called more moderate members of his cabinet want a land invasion. Ironically, it always happened in Bibi. If you look at the history of Israel in Bibi, Bibi is the one who stands behind, be, between the invasion and its uh, implementation. For all these cynical 
um, motivation that you you pointed out, staying in power. Nobody, nobody would be able to write a biography of Benjamin Netanyahu and have a chapter, The Ideology of Netanyahu. There is no ideology. There really is no ideology. There is, uh, who said it, uh, power for the sake of power is the worst kind uh, of power. And, 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 and this, is, this is exactly what they see, we see here with all the manipulation and navigation that go, goes along with it. Well, uh, okay, promise. What, mm. what should we, like, you know, um, what should we be advocating for in terms of our government? I mean, uh, yeah. obviously, like, you know, there was a quote, I think it was in the Times of Israel um, by the, um, by your uh, defense, uh, the, the, the equivalent Glenn. of your defense, Glenn. Yeah, uh, of your defense secretary, Glenn, yes, saying Glenn. something to the effect of like, uh, they wanted us to allow, um, you know, some humanitarian aid in, and what can we do? They give us the guns and uh, the weaponry. And, you know, to some extent, we're told in this country, we don't have that much leverage with Israel, but it's clear that we we do. Or at least there's a, you know, who knows the, the game that's being played back and forth uh, in, in terms of the way that things are being sold domestically in Israel. But we have some leverage. And, and, and what what should we be calling for now? Like ultimately the, uh, an end to the occupation. Uh, but is that the, is, 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 is in calling for an end to the occupation, does it give room for, you know, Israel to say, but first, okay, we'll talk about that after we do this, or do we say cease fire? I mean, what, like, what is the most helpful thing to be advocating for at this at this juncture yeah well you, you can begin with the one of the most bizarre uh, speeches i ever heard in my life when the american representative to the united nation explained why america vetoed a call for a ceasefire why did america say we we don't want to stop massive killing of uh, civilians uh, in gaza this I, go go over that speech. This is one of the most bizarre speeches I ever heard. Uh, it, it is like it was full of moral argument that if you came out from Mars, you would say, "Oh, okay." In the end of the speech, uh, this representative would surely call for an, a ceasefire, end of hostilities, and and the concluding remark of this speech was, "And therefore, we veto the call for a ceasefire," which which is I, I've never heard it before, even in. And American politics had some absurd uh, speeches in its history. This was the worst kind. Now, secondly, after calling for a ceasefire, calling for exchange of prisoners, of course. I don't think at this moment the international community should commit itself for being the, the uh, mediator or facilitator of, of a solution or reconciliation, but at least uh, inject some humanity and sensibility and common sense into the situation, however you want to show your horror, and that's understandable, of what happened on the seventh, uh, on the Saturday of the seventh of October, you cannot lose the big picture. Uh, there were seventh of October done, but to the Palestinians throughout their histories, uh, don't nobody should take here the high moral ground, but an internet, a responsible international community knows that it has the leverage, by the way, on both sides, to bring an end, first of all, to this massive killing, and then to exchange of prisoners. And if you want genuinely to go for reconciliation, include everyone who is involved. Don't uh, have a, a club where you decide who can join and who can jo cannot join. Anybody who's a Palestinian, anyone who's Israeli, needs to be part of this discussion. You cannot exclude anyone. Um, but I don't think that's that's what the international community wants. The international community hopes to to get to some sort of a, a status quo which it can tolerate and contain. Um, you know, and with this I would end, people in Palestine watch the international community reaction to the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. And they don't see that kind of response to the Russian invasion. The Russian invasion was, you know, 
from door to door, uh, wall to wall, this reaction, this condemnation, this this almost arming the other side in order to to stand against the invasion. Uh, the 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 uh, idea that you can sort of play with the lives now of people in Gaza, and by the way, also with the lives of people in Israel, because Hezbollah might be drugged in if this continues, you know, or, or others, other actors might drag in. So the human, you cannot really contain the human disaster into one border. And it's unforgivable that the international community is now not focusing on ending the fire power uh, of Israel and creating conducive uh, conditions uh, to a different kind of a dialogue how long it will take, it doesn't matter, as long as it is the dialogue of words and not the dialogue of bombs or rockets on both sides. Ilan Poppy, professor of history at the University of Exeter, director of the European Center for Palestine Studies, um, author of The Ten Myths About Israel, and many more. We will link to all of those in our podcast and YouTube description. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate your, your allowing us to continue to... The yeah. question you one more, one more, exactly. one more. Right. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you both, uh, Emma and Sam. I, I really uh, enjoyed our time together. Thank you Thank very you. much. Bye -bye. Thank you.